Thank you so much. How is everybody doing tonight? I just have to say that I have been speaking at conferences for more than a decade. I've probably spoken at 300 different events all over the world, in South America, in Australia, in Europe. I have never spoken at a venue like this and at a conference like this. So I think we need to give a big round of applause to the organizers. This is incredible, and I'm proud to be part of it. <clears throat> so I only have 20 minutes with you, so that's really not that long. And I want to start here, and I want to talk about Relentless Adaptation, Three Steps to Thrive in 2017 and Beyond. And the first thing I want to talk about is the rate at which technology changes. Because the truth is, humans are really good at adapting to new technology. In fact, we forget how quickly technology changes. And I want to show you an example of this. So here we have a photo at St. Peter's Square in 2005. And as you can see at this gathering, there's no technology in this photo except for one tiny little flip phone in the bottom right-hand corner. I think I had this exact same phone, incidentally. Now, I want you to come with me on a journey as we fast forward just eight years. And we see how much technology has come into our lives over such a short span. So by 2013, the exact same venue, every single person in the crowd has some piece of technology in their hands, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet. And I show you these photos so that we can think about the next eight years. And as we are gathered here today, I want you to think about 2025. What's going to happen in 2025 as far as the impact of the technology that is growing today, like artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things? What will happen over the next eight years? Because as much as you want to stand there and say to yourself, oh, I don't believe this stuff is happening this quickly, that it's going to change things, if we look at these photos and we see how much things changed in just eight years and how quickly the smartphone revolution changed the way that all of us communicated, you can imagine over the next eight years what's going to happen, some pretty incredible things. Now, couple this with the fact that by the year 2020, there will be 26 billion devices connected to the internet. 26 billion devices. And when I say this number, when I speak at events, I see people looking at me, it's such a massive number. How could you possibly put this number into context? How can you even imagine what that means? And what are these connected devices? Those are things like your garage door, smart locks, refrigerators, smart televisions, and of course, the tablets and the smartphones. And to put this into context, by 2022, the average household with two teenage kids will have roughly 50 internet-connected devices in the home. 50 internet-connected devices in the home. I have an eight-year-old at home, and I can imagine the way things are going to go over the next few years. And as you stand there and you think about this, how could we ever get to the number 50? As I go through the presentation, just think in your mind and maybe start to count on your hands. How many connected devices do you have in the home today? And all of a sudden, I'm sure you'll get to a dozen pretty quickly or maybe two dozen pretty quickly, and you'll realize that by 2022, 50 will be absolutely no problem at all. And by 2025, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's a $36.8 billion market. $36.8 billion. Artificial intelligence is going to change the way that we do pretty much everything. It's also going to affect our jobs. And the wonderful thing about this, in terms of a positive thing, is that right now, Canada is the epicenter as far as artificial intelligence research. You've heard the stories coming out of Toronto and out of Montreal as far as hubs being started there. Uber just announced this week that they're starting up a hub in Toronto as far as researching artificial intelligence for autonomous cars. So we can see that the future is bright in Canada. There's never been a better time to be a Canadian working to build your own business and working in the technology space. I think in contrast to 1999, I graduated from school at the University of King's College, and I moved out to San Francisco to pursue a job in the technology world, working at a company called Razorfish. And at that time, we saw a massive brain drain from Canada. You remember those days. And what we're seeing now is almost the exact opposite. Perhaps over the years, we'll have an influx of people who are coming to Canada and to work here in these different industries. 
And it's really important today in 2017, if you run a business, I don't care if it's a small business, a medium-sized business, or a large business, to fight digital Darwinism. Many of us resist change. And that's why I want to talk to you about some steps to be able to adapt to this new technology and to change the way that we all do things. Because the truth is, remember the photos that I showed you, right? In just eight short years, how quickly things are going to change. And if you don't adapt quickly, no matter what industry that you're in, what happens to those companies who don't adapt quickly? If you think about the list of companies in your head, we're thinking about the Kodaks, the Blockbusters, the Borders. We've seen those companies over and over rise and then fall quickly. And I would argue that every single one of these companies that I have on the list wasn't able to thrive because the truth is they weren't able to adapt to the new way that people were using technology and to adapt to technology in their own businesses. We're seeing it with many companies today. And so the truth is, as we look forward over the next eight years and we think about this shift and we think about the changes that we're facing and how so much is going to happen and how the working world is going to change, the one quote that I want you to keep in your mind over the next uh, 20 minutes as I talk is this quote from race car driver Mario Andretti. If everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. If everything seems under control, you're just not going to fast enough. The truth is, we all have to get a little bit uncomfortable in this world because of the rate at which things are going to change with technology. So what are three steps to grow in 2017 and beyond? Well, the first one, and one of the most important, is this idea of rethinking your mission. Right now, if you work at a business, Think in your head right now, what is the mission of that business? What is your purpose? What are you all about? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to change the world? Are you trying to help people? What is that mission? You should be able to articulate this pretty clearly. And I want to talk about an example quickly about a company that has a very clear mission, one that's articulated in every single thing that they do, and one that I would argue is a mission that will change the world and change the way that kids play, particularly young girls. And this is a story about a woman named Debbie Sterling. Debbie Sterling was an engineering student at Stanford University. And she was a little bit frustrated. She was one of the only girls in her class. And she went out to buy her niece a toy, and she walked into the toy store. She walked down the aisle, and all she saw, saw was an aisle of blue and an aisle of pink. And she wanted to buy a toy to help her niece learn how to build things, but all those toys were for boys. So she came up with this idea of Goldie Blocks, which are engineering toys that are built just for girls. And she went online with a crowdfunding campaign, came up with this phenomenal idea, and raised a ton of money very quickly. And I would argue that she did that because she had one mission in mind. And her mission was to disrupt all things pink. And everything that she did on social media reinforced this mission, including one of the first videos that they had that hit the web. And when I first watched this video, I got chills up my spine because I understood what Goldie Blocks was all about. I understood their mission and their purpose. And I will tell you again, as the mother of an eight-year-old at home, I know as that generation grows up, Generation Z, they absolutely care about doing business with companies, with organizations that want to make the world a better place. And when we talk about mission, let's talk about another company 
Who here hates email, just out of curiosity? <laughs> Pretty much everyone is raising their hand right now. So there was a company started not that long ago called Slack. And the idea behind Slack was to help people just like you who hated email. And they had a really clear mission in mind as well. And their mission was to go out there and to sell organizational transformation. They wanted to transform the way that people communicated online. And they did exactly that. And the last example that I want to talk about as far as rethinking your mission, I want to talk for a second about a company you all know called Netflix. And I want to go back when I mentioned the companies that didn't succeed, that weren't able to adapt. And I want you to think about Netflix for a second. <clears throat> Netflix today is probably one of the most successful digital companies that I know. But I also remember the Netflix of many years ago. And I remember the Netflix that started when I lived in San Francisco. This was a company that actually mailed DVDs to your door, OK? Think about this business. They physically mailed DVDs to your door. This is a business that, for all intents and purposes, should have failed. It should have failed within a few years as the internet became popular. But because they had such a strong leader in Reed Hastings, they were able to thrive, because they were able to adapt, and they were able to change. And if there's one takeaway that I want you to walk away with from my presentation, and one thing you can do, is go online and search for the Netflix Culture Deck. It's a 200-slide presentation that's available online that talks about the Netflix culture. And this idea about their brand promise, which is really a quest. This is their mission, and it's something that they share everywhere online. So the key takeaways as far as this first item, as far as rethinking your mission, is to define your mission, articulate your purpose, and start your quest to change the world. And I believe this is absolutely critical. Years ago, when I got into the technology space, I believed that many of the startups I was going to work with were going to change the world. But what I realized very quickly is that the world was not ready for these startups, and these startups were not ready for the world. But today, in 2017, I think these are different times. And I think we need these companies to go out there and make the world a better place, because the world needs it as well. So the second thing I want to talk about is rethinking platforms. How the platforms of yesterday aren't necessarily the platforms that you want to use today. We're seeing trends out there, like the rise of ephemeral messaging. But again, when we're talking about adaptation, we need to be nimble. We need to be quick on our feet, and we need to be able to change really instantly. Because the truth is, six months ago, if I came to talk to you, I would tell you that every single company needs to be on Snapchat. You have to be on Snapchat. But the truth is, today, Snapchat is important, but all of a sudden, you have Instagram Stories. Instagram Stories has many of the similar features. And in fact, they've just surpassed Snapchat as far as the number of users. So that's one example of a new trend. And if you are able to adapt and be nimble, you're able to leverage those trends as well. We also see out there the rise of live streaming. So when we look at a company like Facebook, and if you use Facebook for any type of marketing, the reality is live streaming allows you to get better engagement than any other type of video that you would put onto Facebook. In fact, it's about three times the engagement that you would get compared to just a traditional video that you would upload there. And more and more, we're seeing those platforms that exist. But I'll tell you one thing as someone who works with many small businesses, is that small businesses aren't the best at being able to adapt and use these new tools. And it frustrates me a little bit, because I have worked in television on and off over the past decade. And if I had told you 10 years ago that all of a sudden there would be a tool that was completely free, that would allow you to broadcast video content to the world, we all would have rejoiced. This would have been absolutely incredible. And today we have these tools out there, and we're not maximizing them as far as being able to leverage them and reach new audiences. Another thing I want to talk about as far as new platforms is the rise of the Internet of Things. You've seen many products out there that are connected to the Internet, like smart thermostats, for example. This is probably one of the most popular items out there when it comes to the Internet of Things. There's a Canadian company called Ecobee that also has a similar thermostat. And we're seeing these changes, again, these hubs that are, are springing up all across the country that are, are, are really focusing on these things. The smart home revolution is here today. And again, think back to that photo that I showed you where it was pre-smartphone and post-smartphone, and in eight years we saw those changes. We're going to see the same thing when it comes to smart homes as well. 
So as far as another platform, and one of the last I want to talk about in this section, it's the rise of virtual reality. And this is another big trend. And I will stand here and talk to you today. I've done shows for Bloomberg. I've been on CNN. I've done lots of media. And this is Canada's time. This is Canada's time to thrive. Artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, virtual realities. We have hubs all across this country. I am not from Toronto, although I live there. I'm from a small town in the country in Prince Edward Island. I grew up with no technology. I went to a two-room schoolhouse. So I'm excited to finally see a time where small towns across this country can leverage this technology and we can really make a name for ourselves. But when you hear virtual reality, you think to yourself, oh, well, why would I care about this? How can, I change, how can it change my world? I want to talk quickly about two things. One, to go back to the example of artificial intelligence. And if you think talking about artificial intelligence sounds boring, let me put it in context here. Researchers have just found out that using artificial intelligence in the healthcare industry allows them to detect if someone has breast cancer 30 times faster than a doctor can detect it. I had just had a very good friend, 42 years old, who passed away a few weeks ago in Toronto from breast cancer. And to know that artificial intelligence could have changed her life with early detection, we see that everywhere. Not only can it detect breast cancer 30 times faster, but it can do it with 99% accuracy. And this is the promise of this technology. Virtual reality can also change our way, world in incredible ways. Let's think, for example, of doing something like I'm doing right now, public speaking. It's the number one fear for most people across the world. But the truth is, imagine if virtual reality could change your experience with public speaking, and it can make it easier, because we're seeing virtual reality today being used for training and to help people get through these things, whether it's training to fly a plane or training to go out there and public speak. If I will go inside a room full of like people, I will get lost. Studies show that with constant practice, people can overcome their fear of public speaking. So, we created a VR program called Be Fearless. What are your plans for the summer vacation? My plans are... Participants all over the world trained with Samsung Gear VR in various levels. And after four weeks of training... That was superb. So as much as you're inundated with the headlines about technology being able to help people create random little widgets and use, useless things, the truth is there's more potential to technology than this, just that, and we're seeing it finally come into fruition. So let's just recap here as far as the key takeaway from rethinking platforms. You want to encourage people to use new platforms, to engage in new ways, because as much as we think that this technology is far off, it is right around the corner, if not here today. And the third and final thing that I want to talk about is rethinking communication and being able to adapt in new ways to be able to communicate with people. And I don't care what you do as far as all the people who are here today, the truth is you're communicating for your job in one way or another. Whether it's being on LinkedIn or you're communicating for your business on social media, you are probably in some way in the business of communication. So what do you need to know about that as far as rethinking the way that you currently do things? Well, we've talked a little bit about culture as far as your mission. We've talked about community, but what about conversation? How can you change the conversation? And we're seeing that already in the digital space. As far as conversation, things like having accessible content, having lower thirds on content when you're creating videos and putting them out there in a space so people can actually read the video content just by the subtitles below. Really easy to do that. In fact, there's a service out there today called Rev that will do this for you very inexpensively, under $10 for a short little video. They'll add the captions to the video. And this all becomes part of this trend that we're seeing towards accessible content, knowing that people are watching more and more content on their mobile devices. The second thing I want to talk about is the rise of bots. 
And we're seeing this everywhere. If you've ever gone onto Facebook and used Messenger, this might blow your mind, but Messenger just started allowing people to add bots to Messenger. This essentially means that using some type of machine learning, which is basically a category of artificial intelligence, a bot is like a robot online, so it's software that guesses and communicates with you and answers questions based on data that it's putting together to answer you. This is one example of a company called Snap Travel, which is based in Toronto. If you want to book a hotel, you can talk to Snap Travel through Messenger. It will help you book a hotel, and it will even book the hotel for you. There are a couple of things that you should keep in mind with the rise of bots. One is the elimination of jobs, because all of a sudden, if a bot can do your job, you're in trouble if you work in customer service, because the way that things are going is towards bots. And again, you may think, well, there are just a few bots out there. But the truth is, today, on Facebook within Messenger, there are one 100,000 bots. This is a technology that just went mainstream a few months ago and already 100,000 bots. So one of the last things that I want to talk about as far as rethinking communication is to think about what I've talked to you about as far as the changes over the next eight years. And I want to kind of look to 2025 because it's a nice span to understand. And I talked about the changes as far as the rise in terms of the number of connected devices, the rise of artificial intelligence as well as virtual reality. And I only got a chance to touch for a second on this next generation, which is Generation Z. As I mentioned, my son is on the young end of Generation Z, but I believe this generation is truly gonna be the generation to change the world, and I'm not the only one to think about that. The truth is, they want to change the world, much more so even than millennials. And we're seeing with this generation, not only do they want to change the world, but this is the first generation that perhaps has the tools in place to change the world. This is the generation that is hardwired to understand technology. Think about them. Anyone born in, say, 2009, 2010 and beyond, what's the first thing they saw when they were born? Probably a smartphone or a tablet that was recording the birth. One of the first things they ever did was to touch a tablet to experience it. This is the generation that walks up to the television set, and they all do this, and they try to press on it to get it to interact like a tablet. It's the touch generation. And this generation is going to have the biggest impact, not only the impact as far as changing the world, but also they're going to impact all of us to be quicker, to be more agile, and to be able to adapt, because it's nothing for them to adapt to new ways of doing things. Think about the changes that they've seen in their lifetime. I can look at my son, who's eight, just as an example. There have been many, many changes in the technology space already. So you want to make sure your content's accessible, you're using new tech to communicate, and you want to prepare for Generation Z. We've talked about millennials over the past couple of years, but trust me, this is the next generation that you're going to hear about. This is the generation, I was just talking to a friend of mine who was mentioning that his son likes to tinker in the garage, and he eventually hacked his lawnmower to be able to mow the lawn itself, okay? He hacked his own lawnmower. This is the generation that's going to go out there. If something doesn't exist, they're going to go out there and they're going to tinker with it, they're going to hack it, they're going to build some software, and they're going to change the way that things are done. And they're going to change things like we're trying to do at the Breakout uh, Project today and this weekend. So again, just to recap, eight years, an eight-year span. Where are we today in 2017? Where are we going to be in 2025? Where does your mind go when I say this after talking about some of this technology? Some incredible possibilities, but we do need to move quickly. Because if you remember just the eight-year spans with smartphones, and we were talking simply about smartphones and tablets, we're talking about a lot more now over the eight years. It's not just about gadgets. It's about software. It's about artificial intelligence and all these new technologies that are going to have a massive impact on all of us. So, just to recap, are you ready for 2025? Are you ready for the next eight years? Are you ready for potentially new job opportunities? Are you ready for maybe new training? Are you ready to change the way that you do business? And most importantly, are you ready to change the world? Thank you very much.